Hello, everyone, and welcome to the AFTD educational webinar, webinar, The Physical Therapist's Role in FTD Care. I'm Will Reiter, the Education Program Manager at AFTD, and I want to thank you all for joining us today. I have just a few items before I introduce our guest presenter to you. Uh, note that our audience will be muted for the duration of the program. Uh, that way, hopefully, we won't hear any dogs barking or conversations in the background, and it will enable us all to be able to hear the presenter clearly. If you do have any technical issues, uh, know that you can write a message in the questions box, and we will do our best to try and assist you. There will also be time four questions and answers at the end of the presentation. So I encourage you to go ahead and, rather than waiting until the end, go ahead and put your questions in the question box as they occur to you. Um, and then we'll address as many questions as time permits. The webinar will be recorded and archived on our YouTube page with all of our other educational webinars and you can visit youtube.com backslash theaftd.org to find our webinar playlist. There are over 20 videos currently, so there's lots more good information uh, to be found. One final announcement. Uh, hopefully, you have all saved the date, April 8th, for AFTD's 2022 Education Conference. Uh, in person, it will be in Baltimore, but it will also be available virtually online. Um, so you can join us from anywhere. Uh, and a special note, uh, we will be requiring that all in-person attendees in Baltimore show proof of vaccination. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for today, Erica Pitch is an associate clinical professor at the University of California, San Francisco. Along with having practiced physical therapy for over 20 years, she has a neurologic specialist certification and specializes in working with those with neurologic disorders. She joined the fac faculty of the UCSF graduate program in physical therapy and rehabilitation science in 2011. So, Erica, welcome to the screen. Nice to have you join us. Um, and uh, whenever we see you and see your PowerPoint, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, our audience should know that uh, UCSF uh, has not only Erica, but uh, the nationally recognized Memory and Aging Center which has a focus on FTD disorders, diagnosis and care. Um, and there is often uh, FTD research taking place at UCSF via, the, and you can find out more about that via the FTD disorders research registry. And I see now that you are ready to go. So that was a, a, a bit extra information and I will depart and leave it to you. All right, thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Um, this is one of the, the things I really enjoy doing as, as part of uh, UCSF's Memory and Aging Center is disseminating and sharing information. Um, also, I would like to reinforce the plug for uh, the AFTD's uh, YouTube channel. There is just so much great information there that um, it's an amazing resource for um, patients, families, caregivers, so strongly encourage you to go there. Um, all right, so let's just jump right in. So this first picture, I use the roadmap image. Um, it's not a perfect analogy, but the, one of the things I think about is one of the therapist's role is to help give you directions. You're the one that has to take the journey, but the therapist, you know, any rehab, rehabilitation professional and your care providers are the ones that may help you navigate uh, the road ahead. So let's move on. And now, okay, uh -huh, here we go. All right. So our objectives for today, um, you'll be able to uh, differenti differentiate between physical and occupational therapy, both rehabilitation professionals. Um, you'll be able to understand how 
the individual with FTD can benefit from physical therapy. You'll be able to understand when to investigate, uh, advocate for, and obtain PT services. And also, because movement is so important, the learner will be able to have at least one strategy to increase their activity level. Because one of the things we're learning more and more is that not moving is detrimental to health and moving more is much more beneficial to health. So if the word exercise is not a fun word for you, that's okay. It's movement that's really important. And we know that movement and exercise is medicine. So by any way that you can start moving more and sitting less is a good thing. So hopefully by the end of today, you'll have some ideas on how to do that. And I keep clicking the wrong button. There we go, okay. So jumping right in, what's physical therapy? And this definition comes from the American Physical Therapy Association's website. Uh, they have a whole uh, website just for patients and families to get information about physical therapy. So it's called Choose PT. So that, that website is also later on this uh, uh, presentation. But um, physical therapists are licensed healthcare providers. So in every state, they have to take a board's exam that uh, gives them sort of a, a legal uh, license to practice physical therapy. So anyone with the designation physical therapist or PT has gone through an accredited, accredited education program and has a license. Um, so sometimes that can get confusing because PT also is the same letters for a personal trainer or a physical trainer. But legally, the only person that can put a PT behind their name is a uh, licensed physical therapist. So what do they do? They evaluate, diagnose, and manage health conditions and movement problems in people of all ages and abilities. And so what the physical therapist does from a diagnostic perspective is diagnoses the movement problem. We don't make medical diagnoses, so we can't diagnose someone with FTD or any of its variants. But we'll, through our physical exam and our, our history taking, we can identify what the movement problem is and develop a strategy to help address it. Um, they also empower people to take an active role in their care. So a lot of what we do is education. Okay, so they also play a unique role in promoting health, wellness, and fitness. So not only just solving a, a problem when it happens, so pe people typically think of physical therapy when, you know, an athlete tears their ACL or a person has a stroke or an injury where, or they, you know, injure their back or they have to go to physical therapy to get back to their prior level. But it also can be, take a role in, well, if you're doing fine, but you have a problem that is, you know, by definition, a degenerative process, we don't want to add atrophy to that problem. So we can take, you know, jump in early, teach people movement strategies in order to potentially prevent decline um, related to just atrophy and things like that, and hopefully, you know, slow the, the, the decline related to the illness process. Now, the other big part of that is overcoming barriers to regular physical activity to benefit physical, mental, and social health. So I put that in bold because that's, the cornerstone of everything we do, whether it's the barriers, back pain to apathy, to just not knowing what to do. The therapist is there to help folks to be able to find those resources and whether it's an active exercise strategy or even doing something differently. Maybe it's changing how you get out of bed or how you climb the stairs. Maybe it's using a device to help you do those things. So we have a number of different uh, strategies to do that, but the main goal is to help people be as independent and as functional as possible because we know that not only helps your physical health, but also mental health and social health. So it's it's all of those things. Okay, so how does physical therapy differ from occupational therapy? Well, from the American Association of Occup uh, the AOTA, American Occupational Therapy Association, just like APTA, but OT. So, you know, and it's, you can read this too, but um, in the simplest terms, occupational therapists help with those activities of daily living. So it's not necessarily people think occupation like a job, 
but it's occupation of things you need to do on a daily basis. Get dressed, get a haircut, work. So in the picture we see on the left here, it's not only the barber having the dexterity to comb and, and, and use the clippers, but also the person getting their haircut, being able to make the appointment, get themselves to the appointment, um, groom their hair when they're not at the barbers, you know, get dressed, prepare a meal, um, all of those things. And it can also be more complex things like managing their finances. And I also put this picture of the coffee cup because, you know, I think one of my first things, if I ever had a problem was how can I make my coffee? And then, then the day starts. But that all revolves around not only knowing the procedure for getting the coffee beans, boiling the water, doing all that safely, but also possibly the dexterity to grab the cup. And this is where sometimes physical therapy and occupational therapy do have some overlap. Okay, and how they're similar. So both of us are rehabilitation prof uh, professionals that focus on being able, helping people function. We use multiple strategies to do this in, turn, in terms of education, movement habits, um, exercise, and sometimes hands-on care. Um, and the, the strategies we use are similar. So these include prevent, compensate, and recover or improve, um, or even just like preserve if we can. Okay, we'll get back to that in a second. So where we live in terms of um, how we intervene. So this is what we see here on the slide is the World Health Organization um, International Classification of Function. So it's a way of viewing how people are independent and how their health condition influences their ability to do things. So for example, at the top, we have the health condition, which is, or um, if you consider it more from a problem standpoint, that would be the disorder or the disease. You know, whether it's FTD or a back injury or an ACL or ankle sprain, something as, as, as you, know, you know, common as that or something, um, and any sort of uh, medical pathology. So we don't address the pathology. That's not where rehabilitation can, you know, the, the rehabilitation has its effect. What we do is look at the implications of that health condition on looking, going straight down to the bottom, that activities or what they also may call the activity limitations. This means like what people need to do. That's stand up, walk, get out of bed, reach for an object. You know, those building blocks of function. Going in either direction, participation is what that is important to you and how you do that. So is it being a parent? being a spouse, going to work, being a teammate on a sports team. It's all those things that how you participate and fulfill your role in society, right? So oftentimes we'll be setting goals of being able to walk across the street so they can go get their groceries or get up their stairs so they can actually leave their home, that kind of thing. Now, what we look at in our physical exam is figuring out why people are having a problem with those activities. And that's where the body structures and functions come in. That's flexibility, strength, power. So not only just brute force, but can you generate brute force in a quick amount of time? Or endurance, can you, do you have the muscular endurance to carry that bag of groceries on the walk back home? Or do you have the balance to do that? So that's often where we will intervene is explain the why in order to do those activities. Now, for each individual, that's modified by environmental and personal factors. So this is where they live, who they live with, other variables, including you know, socioeconomic status, all those things. We have to take those into consideration because someone who lives two hours from the clinic or out in the country on a dirt road or has to, you know, do all kinds of stuff on an, un, you know, uneven ground outside their home versus someone who has an elevator and a high rise, their things they need to do and how they do it are going to be different. And so we have to look at that whole person when we're intervening. And this is where all rehabilitation professionals, not only physical and occupational therapy, but also speech language pathologists, 
look at rehabilitation in this way and to, so in order to consider the whole person and what they need to do okay so talking about activities from that you know middle section there activities would include like i said functional movements sitting up from lying down standing up transfers going from one surface to another um reaching and grasping or even getting up from the floor or sports whereas occupational therapy focuses on that bathing, toileting, feeding, or instrumental things like shopping, managing finances, or driving. So you can see that sort of middle part where both, both professionals will work on getting out of bed. Both of them can work on standing up from sitting down. Physical therapists might work on the fundamentals of just from any surface, whereas an occupational therapist may focus on, okay, how do you get off your toilet in your home? And how do we do that? Where they specialize also is occupational therapists will definitely work more on driving and those sort of um, executive things there. They may often be, may be found in psychiatric hospitals where it's more of a behavioral problem and less of a uh, functional mobility problem. So there's some overlap in a lot of settings and then there's some specialized settings that they work in. Um, also from a uh, upper limb standpoint, therapists may work on throwing sports, um, sometimes fine motor, uh, both can get a certification in hand therapy, whereas occupational therapists will really focus on how do you use your hands in order to do those basic activities of daily living. They tend to, if you need a hand splint, they're the people to go to. Um, and both of us are are good at using adaptive equipment. So anything from walkers and canes, occupational therapists are the ones that are great for getting you that long handled reacher or a dressing stick or things that can help you um, do your activities of living, uh, daily living more effectively and independently. So how do we do this? So there's three main categories in terms of how we approach someone's movement problem. And I always tell my students that when I get lost, if you have a, you, especially with rare conditions, we may not have seen, a, you know, some of my students may not have seen someone with, with um, a specific neurologic pathology. And I always tell them when you get lost, always go back to what are you trying to prevent? What can you improve or try to preserve? And what do we need to compensate for? Right, so if we can't improve it or it's gonna take a long time to improve, then we might need to compensate for that. And also with the long view of what things are we trying to prevent, right? So we're trying to prevent decline. We're trying to prevent falls. We're trying to prevent deconditioning. And that's one of the big things I keep arguing for is that if we don't know the trajectory of our disorder, you know, our, our, the, 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 neuro, the, the neurologic illness has, you know, its trajectory. We don't want to add to that by adding atrophy and deconditioning, adding insult to injury. So we, want, so we don't want to lose more ground just because we got weak. Because everybody, if they stop moving, if you stay in bed for a week, atrophy happens. We're trying to avoid that as much as possible. And I'm sure we all learned from the COVID pandemic about not getting out as much, how, how much harder it is to walk up a hill if you haven't done it in a while. Okay, so let's take a look at the other ones. Okay, so in particular, so I think you know, the recovery part or the preservation is pretty self-explanatory, but compensation means using a different strategy or device to achieve that functional mobility goal. So for example, if balance is a really challenging problem and maybe it's too unstable or takes a lot of energy or a lot of concentration to get across the room or there's frequent falls using something like a walker can be really really helpful to allow people the independence and the stability to get from point a to point b and that's what we end up doing a lot is is at that point of deciding well when is it the right time to use that walker and Although it's an individual decision, things that sort of weigh into doing that is how often are they falling? How, how well you know, we can assess like their, their, their walking uh, both speed and balance. How does their, their gait and their independence change when they're using a device? 
And often, like both myself, patients, family members will watch somebody walking, you know, on their own, and all of us are sort of like on high guard, and then they use the walker and everyone relaxes and the patient relaxes and they it, they they find it's easier and they can walk further and more. It's a means to an end in order to be able to do more and be more independent. It's not a complete guarantee against falling, but it, 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 it can allow more mobility and more safety. The image I have here, this is a walker called the U-step walker, which is, you know, has, you know, like your typical wheeled walker. So it has a bunch of wheels, handbrakes. What's different about it is that the brakes are on. You have to want to go. So you have to squeeze the brakes in order to move. So for someone who um, has a lot of, um, gets a lot of forward momentum and has a hard time stopping, it's much easier to just let go of the brakes and have the brakes on as opposed to trying to stop a rollator that can get away from you. And that's what often people are worried about with a standard walker that you see everywhere um, that has the brakes that you have to squeeze to stop is that sometimes it can get away from people. Um, things that both physical and occupational therapists will often recommend as well is things like the shower chair or a raised toilet seat because loss of balance in the bathroom is especially hazardous and especially probable, right? Because you have a wet floor, you have tile, you have towel racks that look awfully tempting to be a grab bar, but are not load tested for being a grab bar. So getting that bathroom area safe is really important. And so sometimes if they need, you know, a big overhaul, you can get occupational therapy in there, but also physical therapy can also do home safety evaluations. So that's where we sort of overlap. Whereas something the occupational therapist would do is really help with that sort of how, how what are the mechanics of, of, of having a meal? Is it hard to control the spoon or the knife? And sometimes just simply adding a buildup to the handle, making it bigger, is easier to grip. Okay. It's really hard to read the audience when all I see is my own screen. All right, so thinking about strategies. So when would we use one versus the other? And so if we look at in terms of, if we go from left to right, yes, in terms of time, right? So over the course of time or over the course of a disorder progression, early on, you know, and so here we got the color coding here. So the top we have prevention. Then we have the green is that sort of per, uh, improve or preserve. And then the blue would be compensate. So of course, early on, we're just trying to prevent decreased mobility or deconditioning from just not moving. As problems become more significant, then the pre fall prevention becomes more and more important. And then as, as, as the disease progresses further, when they need more physical assistance from a caregiver, we're trying to make that as easy as possible for the caregiver and still try to preserve that independence and give them tools in order to um, help their loved one uh, function as much as possible, but also without with uh, them being safe. Um, conversely, or similarly with sort of the, the strategies for preserve and improve, Early on, I would love it if with anyone who was initially given a, a neurologic diagnosis, whether it's FTD or Parkinson's or Huntington's or multiple sclerosis, let's just do the, you've been given the diagnosis from the neur neurologist, can we do a one-time physical therapy visit in order to make sure you have all the tools you need in order to get as much exercise, you know, the the, Five, you know, 150 minutes a week, two days a week of strength training. We'll talk about that more in just a sec. But if we could just get going early, it wouldn't take a ton of therapy, but if we can prevent as much as possible, prevent that decline, we can be way ahead of the game. So that's what we're trying to do first, is really push the fitness as much as possible. As um, the disease progresses, you may have more mobility deficits, then we might be going towards, okay, well, can we just train functional mobility? Can we, can we still work on those functional mobility habits? We're always fo focusing on balance, but it might take even more of a precedence here. 
Um, and as we get towards more, you know, the more difficulties with balance, that's when we might get towards those things like using an assistive device. Further on, if people are, are not able to get out of bed by themselves or, or they need a lot of assistance, then we're trying to keep people comfortable. We're trying to keep them flexible so that they can position to even have a meal. So for example, if someone's in uh, using a wheelchair for a lot of mobility and if they have a lot of spinal weakness, it's even harder to maintain good posture. If you're not in good posture, then it's harder to breathe. It's harder to position your head to eat effectively. And so again, this is where physical and occupational therapy may um, work, work together is helping preserve that range of motion in order to uh, position their head so they can um, eat or get dressed or be assisted with dressing. And again, lastly, we don't use compensa compensatory strategies early because we're trying to preserve, you know, push and preserve. And then as, as things become more difficult, then we might go towards a walker or a wheelchair. So, um, and that depends on, you know, basically where the person's at and, and, and what works with them. And so your therapist can help you sort of problem solve those types of things. Okay. So why is physical therapy so important? I think I, I've sort of talked about that already, but we're gonna, we're gonna dive into it some more or reinforce that, is that here's this great image from the US Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and it's actually a published guideline for physical activity guidelines for Americans. Um, it was also the source was um, this paper here. So Euclid et al, um, in terms of, look at this title, does physical activity attenuate or even eliminate the detrimental association of sitting time with mortality. And a meta-analysis, you know, that's a lot of people, of more than one million men and women. So that's a lot of people. And so what we're seeing here is that, so we have daily sitting time and mod how much moderate to vigorous physical activity. So as you can see here, the more you sit, the more likely bad things will happen. The more you move, the less likely things will happen. Bad, bad health things will happen. So first rule of thumb is move more, sit less. Okay, because it's, it's yeah, there's, and, and this is not the first time that's been summarized. There's, one of the originals was the Framingham Heart Study that tracked people for their lifetimes. And what they found is that people who were more active had a less probability of dying of anything, which is, Kind of mind boggling. Um, so how do we get started with this? I'm oh, sorry. Okay, and we'll talk more about that in just a sec. Um, but from a specific standpoint, let's talk about how people with FTD can benefit from physical therapy. So let's look at some examples. So we have Byron, who was recently diagnosed with the behavioral variant um, of FTD and has a history of low back pain. So in this case, the person's problem, and this could also be, be true for like primary uh, progressive aphasia, where the main problems related to the illness aren't necessarily motor, but that doesn't make you immune from having other orthopedic issues. And the problems associated, especially with the behavioral variant, that might just make things a little bit more difficult to implement. We're going to talk about that. Then we'll talk, talk about Janet with corticobasal syndrome, and then Jose with progressive supranuclear palsy. So looking at different uh, problems associated with these uh, various uh, variations of FTD and how we can intervene. And I keep clicking the wrong button. Okay, so let's take Byron, for example. So he had back pain previously. He had learned some exercises from physical therapy several years ago, and we hear this a lot, where people say, well, as long as I do my exercises, I don't need physical therapy anymore. I actually just met someone the other day. who was like, oh, yeah, I did PT. It's great. I do my exercises, I'm fine. So I'm sorry, I don't need to come to PT. I'm like, don't, don't apologize. That's great. Because if you are your own best therapist, that gives you the tools to manage things. That's fantastic. Because there's plenty of other people that are naive to exercise. Um, and so that, you know, pre, pre diagnosis and pre COVID, he was doing all right. Then shelter in place hit, atrophy kicks in. So we have shelter in place plus apathy, then atrophy happens, inactivity happens, and here the back pain is back. So now he's referred to physical therapy, and that can either come from the primary care provider or his neurologist, 
or even if he's in the state with direct direct access, you can contact your local therapist and say, hey, I, I'm due for a tune-up. Um, and that's what we have here. So alternatively, you can reach out to the previous physical therapist or go to choosept.com and you can actually look by your zip code for a therapist near you. They have listings of uh, which therapists are specialists. So in this case, you may want someone who's a more spine specialist than, well, that could be probably a neurotherapist too. But if it's a complex spine issue, you want to go with the one that's really, really good at that particular problem. We all have a, when we get our licenses, we are generalists. But for me, I've been practicing neuro for 20 years. If you got a complex spine issue, you probably want to see my, want to see one of my colleagues because they're better at it. And my colleagues who are better at the ortho stuff will be asking me about how to modify the neuro issues. So for in this case, because they're relatively early on, they have a problem that we know what the problem is, right? So we know it's this deconditioning, it's the same back pain, it's not something, uh, it hasn't changed its characteristic, we know it's the same problem, then we're really gonna try to work on preserving and improving that, getting back to the normal before um, we stop moving. We get this, we've, I'm seeing this a lot lately. If so many people were doing fine and then with the change in workload, with the drop in activity level, we see a, a, a tremendous uh, decline in their function just from lack of movement. And so now we have to figure out another starting point. Okay. Right. I keep clicking the wrong buttons. So there we go. Okay. So how you can help. So as a caregiver, you might want to communicate with a therapist ahead of time and attend the visit with Byron so that you can help out with the plan, um, provide maybe a history on prior exercises um, that worked or the ones that he was interested in, um, and also using that what Byron was interested in because especially if you're having things that are, uh, if you're having problems with, with apathy or disinterest, you want to tap into those things that previously gave him enjoyment and use that as a starting point. You know, it's 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 hard enough for anyone to stick to an exercise program. Most uh, Americans don't exercise. So now we're adding sort of a barrier to that. So we want to incorporate those things that are enjoyable for him. And that might be the best option for um, incorporating more movement. Also, with apathy comes in a lack of initiative. So as a caregiver, you can't expect him to go, hey, I want to go for a walk today. That's that's. The, the apathy is kind of what got him in this situation. So being able to provide that support and routine in order to do things. And let me just say right out of that too, I should have said this sooner, none of this is easy. This is extremely difficult. And so I, 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 it's always hard because, you know, having been a caregiver for my mom with dementia, having been a caregiver and trying to promote activity for everyone, this is extremely difficult in order to help gently provide that structure, but you don't want to be nagging. And there's so many things that you're asking your loved one to do that now here's another thing we're going to ask them to do, and they're already kind of irritable. So it is not easy. Trying to incorporate by example, having setting a routine, like for example, like, okay, every morning let's go for a walk after breakfast or after we've had our coffee. Um, this is where pets are great because they may not go walking for themselves, but oftentimes walking the dog can be a really good motivator. Um, I'll often tell my dog to go walk my husband. Um, but, um, yeah, that can be a good motivator because remember we're, we're the first order of business is move more, sit less. So even if we don't get the 30 minutes of cardio, just little bits of walking throughout the day like a dog that needs to pee a lot, is gonna be great. Um, finding those exercises that worked best last time and simplify it, because also going with what they already know is gonna be a lower threshold to implementation than trying something new and complicated. That's why also um, communicating with the therapist, telling the therapist what you're hoping for and asking like, you know what? Can I have three exercises? And often we teach in physical therapy school that you want to limit the number of things because the more things to do, the less likely they'll be done. But emphasize to the therapist, please give me, please keep it simple. Keep it concrete and bang per minute exercise, a so benefit per minute 
And what we know is that sometimes walking is going to be the first benefit for, per minute. Okay. So also introducing opportunities for movement throughout the day. And the goal would be to get at least 30 minutes of movement once, you know, as you build up to that. Okay. All right. So also, um, I know there was a previous talk on using art and music, so I'm not going to um, uh, go into this in too much detail, but in searching the literature, I was hoping to find, you know, I searched basically frontotemporal degeneration to see if there was any specific research in general, not a ton. But I found this article, which I thought was just great. Look at this, music therapy and physical act activity to ease anxiety, restlessness, irritability, and aggression in individuals with dementia with signs of frontotemporal lobe degeneration. So kind of dement dementia first, degeneration after. Um, so not exactly, you know, it's, it's sort of in, within the category that, that we're looking at here, but I think it raises some good points is that and also sort of preaches to the choir. I am a big fan of using mute music to promote movement because rhythm helps drive movement. It can tap into things that people enjoy. So whatever, you know, songs that people like that can help, uh, help a lot with motivation. And also it might help um, with the emotional state as well. Okay. Okay. So moving on, just making sure. Oh, we're good. Okay. So Janet, take Janet for example. So she, she was recently diagnosed with cortical basal syndrome and her main complaint was that she had left hand stiffness and decreased speed and fluidity, fluidity of movement. When her neurologist diagnosed her, she asked like, well, is there anything I can do from an exercise standpoint? And she goes, I exercise a lot and want to know if there's anything specific I should be doing. And the neurologist was like, go ask Erica. Um, so what we did, was basically we got a baseline, looked at her strength, her uh, flexibility, her coordination and balance screening, just because that's, and falls are really bad. So I want to do that with everyone. The reason why I have a picture of marbles here is that um, although there are standardized tests in terms of like, you know, moving pegs around and things like that, we didn't have that available at our clinic. So um, I used one of those Talenti ice cream containers that was empty and put marbles in it. And so the task was to unscrew the jar, take out five marbles, and then put them back in again and compare one hand to the other hand. So again, so we're working on very fine motor tasks. Um, and also the going on, the, the, the protractors here is to look at her available range of motion and make sure there weren't any restrictions. So we, um, let me make sure I'm on the right place. Okay. So of course our strategy for Janet at this point, especially since it's early on, is that preserve and prevent. So, an education on the exercise recommended daily allowances. So, um, it's recommended that every adult with a brain should get 30 minutes of exercise or 30 minutes of movement five days a week and adding two days a week of strength training. Um, we also gave her stretches for her wrist and hand. And I also educated her about what occupational therapy could do. And so, if it was really getting in the way of her meal preparation and activities of daily living, she could consider working with an occupational therapist as well. She's like, mm, not quite yet. I think I got this. This was really helpful. Thank you. But also I'm kind of bored with my exercise program. Do you have any ideas? And I said, well, I do teach a uh, balance class. It's based on music and dancing and, and um, uh, exercise approach for Parkinson's. So she's joined that. So she comes to uh, Erica's dance party twice a week. Um, and two years later, now she's having a little bit more difficulty with her hand and um, she did uh, see occupational therapy for some from, for some tricks with that. Um, and they gave her some uh, just a little bit of equipment for helping open jars um, so she could have a little bit more grip strength there. She's also debating Botox, but at this point, the stiffness isn't getting to the point where it's um, for her worth, worth doing the botulinum toxin injection. And if there are questions on that, I can uh, talk about that uh, later. Um, so here's actually a really great resource. So this is from the, um, the, the US recommendations on activity. The, they have a whole campaign called Move Your Way. And so it talks about all those different things that can count as exercise, from dancing to swimming to walking the dog to aggressive weed pulling, because you're doing a lot of squats there. Um, also muscle strengthening activities, so things that make your muscles work harder. So that's doing your, 
your squats with the bag of groceries or uh, carrying out the bag of bird seed, those type of things. All right, there you go. And just to highlight, to make it really big, this is like the key recommendation of just getting that 150 minutes a week, which amounts to about 30 minutes a day, uh, five days a week. But if that's too hard, just start somewhere. Just start moving more and sitting less. Okay, so for example, if someone's not moving at all, even just walking around their home three times a day, then maybe walk around your neighborhood three times a week and so add some sit to stands or some you know, playing tug of war with the dog. Start somewhere and start increasing that frequency. Okay, so lastly, let's talk about Jose with a supernuclear palsy, progressive supernuclear palsy. So his main problems were frequent falls and slowness of movement. So more time to walk and get in and out of bed. So ideally he'd start as early as possible. Um, so we're working on preserve and prevent early on. Later stage, it would be more compensatory strategies. So we're looking at functional mobility, walking speed, balance, including what balance while dual tasking and teaching movement strategies for standing up and sitting down, using assisted devices and modifying the environment. Um, ideally, we would start folks early, get people going on a program, so relatively frequent visits to establish that, spread it out, and then once they kind of they know what they're doing and they're pretty much stable with that, they can graduate from PT at that time and then maybe come back in on an orbit of about six months to a year for a check-in. And then if things have changed, then maybe do another bout of therapy. But I would love it if people had a standard practice just to check in with their physical therapist like they do with their neurologist. Someday, or possibly just ask. We have a multidisciplinary clinic where um, when, when they're seeing their neurologist, I'm there as well, so they can check in with me. Okay, when and how to advocate. So when there's a gap or knowledge or ability that is impacting your ability to function safely. That's what you argue to, your, to any provider or why you need therapy is I could do this before or I don't know what I need to do to help do things better. Keywords are decline in function or falls. That's a big red flag for, for getting into CPT. Remember to expect on frequency. So you're not gonna be able to see physical therapy three times a week forever. It's more getting, getting those tools, how to apply them, and, and uh, work with them from there so you can give the therapist feedback on how to modify that. Where to find one is choosept.com. You need to confirm with your insurance, com uh, with your insurance company about coverage. Um, and have a plan for sticking with your exercise program beyond PT. So asking like for community resources or there's exercise classes, um, even working with a, with a personal trainer afterward if um, consistency is a problem or even training caregivers or, um, and of course training the family member. Okay, Phew. so I had to start speeding up there. So in summary, we talked about how physical PT and OT are, are similar and different. So both rehabilitation professionals, OT with activities of daily living, PT with the functional mobility um, and level independence, how rehab can help across the lifespan disorder. So with exercise, with habit, with equipment, ways to increase activity, make the retreat, routine, engage allies, including pets, using music, finding things that were fun and motivating. Um, and so the big take home too is that lack, lack of activity is a major problem and exercise is medicine. So, uh, using physical PT can help with uh, helping helping you find the way to do that most effectively. All right, and there's a comment there and there shouldn't be. All right, Whew. with that, thank you so much for your time, your attention, and for having me. So at this point, I'm gonna stop sharing. If I can get to that, or did you have me stop sharing already? Um, I'm gonna start sharing, which will Great. stop you from sharing. Okay. Um, and 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 thank you so much, Erica. I um, one I really appreciated your message about how to advocate because I'm sure that uh, family members and even healthcare professionals who are supportive of someone with FTD uh, sees a need for yeah. physical therapy and doesn't always have an open doorway. So you provided some examples for that. Um, it was also really helpful for you to talk about. Um, Byron, Janet, and Jose in terms of the three different types of FTD and how a physical therapist might work with them. So yeah. I'm going to encourage people 
to go ahead and continue to send in some questions. We have a few that that I'm going to pose to you, okay. um, but uh, we still have room for more. So go ahead and uh, respond. Um, you know, I, I think the first question that I'll ask you, and it's actually a twofer, combining two two attendees questions. Great. So um, uh, a, a person uh, said that their husband who lives in a facility had been walking every day uh, through assistance spot with her as well as um, assistance from a provider. And as you said, COVID hit and then things changed, I'm sure in terms of uh, individuals coming into the facility um, and potentially other challenges. Um, she was asking, I, I know you spoke to this a little, but maybe talk a little bit more about how to scale a person back. She she posed, you know, is it time for a walker, which I know you won't be able to maybe respond to that directly. Um, and then I'll have another question about walkers but I'll just stop there because I don't want to give you too much to chew on. Gotcha. Okay. So, so the parts are like how, how to continue with activity when you can't get in there and support the family member. And also when is it time to use the device? Right. And, and now I think uh, I was maybe reading between the lines, but uh, things sound like maybe they've opened up a little more. So how to get, how to work with her husband to, to get the person to recover some of that skill and ability. He's now kind of tentative and um, is not in a, a place where he was. Yeah, and that right there is, so the decline from pre-COVID to now post-COVID, things are, are, are opening up, but now the person is more tentative that's the time to get physical therapy in. So that's the huge argument for asking for a physical therapy referral to not only get restarted on an exercise program, but specifically to evaluate for an assistive device. So that, that's one of the big arguments, like when you can go, because especially in a facility, you would need a, a referral for physical therapy, but that, that could be right in the heading, you know, they'll, 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 when the physician sends a referral to physical therapy, you can just even say, evaluate for assistive device use and screen for fall risk and establish an exercise program. So you have a very specific goal of what you're hoping to accomplish so that, that you can establish more of a program on their own. Also, especially in a facility like that, where it's, it's, my heart goes out to them because they are on roller skates and they're scrambling and, and everyone in there needs to move and everyone needs to walk. And I, 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 I feel, you know, really just my heart goes out to them because, you know, I've worked in, in places like that where you want to help everyone. It's important to work with the staff. And so you're clear about like, look, I know how I can help my family member. Do I have permission to do that? If not, can I set, you know, do some chair exercises with them? Can we use some YouTube videos or can we go through some exercises, you know, in his room? So having like alternatives where you're presenting to, to especially the staff, I'm trying to decrease your burden. You know, please let me do, do have some things that I can do with my family member that maybe might be a little bit safer and not worrisome for them. I mean, just doing like little sit to stands at the counter where they're holding on like playing, you know, throwing, I've, I've thrown bean bags with my mom um, using her walker because she really liked throwing things at cows when she was growing up. And so she would stand and like do that for a really long time. But, you know, going doing marching in place, not interested. So finding those things and working with a therapist in order to have those things and asking the therapist those specific questions. That's a great justification for physical therapy. Great, great. So just a quick follow-up with the walker. One of our attendees asked, and I'm sure other people are interested, can you say the name of that walker that you highlighted where uh, you yes. press to go and I think you let go to stop yeah. um, and spell it out so that people can really follow up with what it is. The letter U, step, S-T-E-P. Okay. Great, great. Um, another uh, person has 
really asked about um, uh, challenges with uh, behavioral FTD and aphasia, and um, in terms of, um, you know, cognitively remembering how to sit and stand, um, how to lie on the bed. So, so initiating movement. So um, it appears there's some cognitive challenges in that area. Um, and I, I think, um, or you interpret it as you will, I, I think what any suggestions you might have for that? Oh, really, really good question. Um, one, I think one of the problems I, I see a lot, not only from myself, but the family members, is that we're so eager to fix and help, we start talking and giving a lot of instructions. Reach here, push there, do that. And the amount of information to process becomes a bottleneck. So first, first thing to try is talk less. Keep the instructions short. Keep them externally focused. And what I mean by that is instead of, you know, a physical therapist analyzes movement. So we could say, hinge at your hips, keep your chest up, move your center of gravity over your base of support. That's not going to work. But reach here, push here, come with me. You know, so having like it, using a walker, having even like bright, putting brightly colored tape on where you want them to move or even having the handles on the walker a little bit brighter color. So they just know, grab here, go there. That tends to work a lot better than all the words. Um, even like getting in and out of bed. I think one of the big problems is that people will kind of, as a whole, bed mobility is extremely variable. People pick all kinds of different strategies. But one of the places where things get really dangerous is sitting down too soon and then kind of sliding off. So getting that, you know, putting a, a, a target way in the middle of the bed so I have to scoot back far. And again, sit here, kind of tap, you know, patting, patting the bed, you know, scooch over there so you keep those cues short. Um, one of the other things that I've, I've worked a lot with is, um, I'm trying to find something here. Um, so there's a whole body of work on external focus of attention. Focusing outside your body helps people move better than um, focusing on body parts. And okay, well, I have eight different necklaces here and I'm, ah, all right, sorry, can't find it here. Imagine if you will, you had a stopwatch or a gold medal around your neck. Right, so if you're leaning forward, that gold medal represents like a plumb line, your center of gravity. So keeping that gold medal between your feet helps you stay forward as you come up. Because when people stand up or sit down, they're often so afraid of falling backwards that they never can get off their feet. So that 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 uh, the pendulum around their neck helps improve that forward lean and is much more intuitive. It's another visual cue as opposed to lean forward. You know, we often say nose over toes, but that's still like, <laughs> we've never used that before, but go here, reach there, tends to work a lot better. Great, great. So, um, sort of staying with um, cognitive challenges and, and persons who may have progressed and um, in terms of learning, um, and safety with assistive devices. Oh. I'm sure that physical therapists have to uh, comprehensively evaluate and through trial and error, but in a safe, uh, managed way, determine right. whether a person has the ability to use a device, uh, especially in relation to uh, ambulation or mobility. Oh. where the safety issues would be paramount. What would you say about that? Oh, again, really good question and very tough answer. Um, okay. with, yeah, because part of it, you're right, like part of the, the, the nature of the illness is that diminished capacity to learn. And it depends on what kind of learning or what kind of learning approach we're trying to enforce. So for example, um, strategy-based learning, which is that sort of cognitive, I'm going to reach, you know, 
understanding or analyzing the problem and, and developing your own solution, that's not going to work. Reward-based learning, does that feel better? Does that, do? am I, you know, because sometimes even just, um, sometimes walking with the device can relieve their pain, can help them feel more stable, but it does require that higher repetition and, and being able to process that feedback. Both of these mean early and sooner rather than later, right? So getting that habit in um, and getting familiar with the device uh, sooner and no just knowing how to use it. But if it's already, you know, um, past that point, um, it still requires high repetition and setup and making the alternative the most appealing solution. So case in point, um, again, with learning from my mother, she would sit on this chest of, you know, the, the, this box basically. It was like, you know, held blankets in it, but it was a, you know, thing to sit on. And as she was getting dressed and it was right next to the bathroom door and to get up, she would always want to reach for the swinging door handle. And as a physical therapist, it made me crazy. And, you know, this, you know, as a caregiver, you know, there's a lot of stuff like that where you're just like, why are you doing that? So I was like, all right, PT brain, let's raise the seat a little bit. So that way she could just get out of the chair easier. And we, you know, tried to get like a little railing right there. So the door handle was less tempting than the thing to push up from, or, and also it was easier to just get up from there anyway, and also setting up with the walker in front. So now it was something to reach for that was way more available than that unsafe door handle. So that would be the big thing is I think when you, when, when learning doesn't happen, it's setting up the environment. So it's intuitive and, 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 and so the most, yeah, I think that would be like the, 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 probably the best and most pragmatic option is making the most appealing option, the safest one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you, you've been answering some really tough questions. Um, I'm going to pose one more. Okay. And then yeah, we're, um, we're, we're going to probably need to close the questions. So there's actually an attendee uh, that um, her family member actually has one of those used step walkers. So um, the challenge is, and, and you can speak to this maybe with a question, but also in a broader perspective, um, which is um, he often refuses to use it. And I, I think that, um, you know, that, that happens for a lot of individuals in terms of an assistive device right. and care partners in particular, I, I think feel really bad that they're not able to like uh, encourage this person, like that they're doing something wrong. So, so speak to how you work with that and, and how you resolve uh, whether it, it moves forward in the right direction or not, or in oh. the best direction. Yeah, that's that's really really tough because you know by by the nature of the beast that lack of empathy, the lack of safety and aware, awareness is part of the problem. So like typically with 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 other populations, if the if the patient doesn't want to do that, oftentimes you can I can you know remind them of the caregiver's distress. Like, if you don't want to do it for you, can you do it for your caregiver? Because can you see how you're holding on to your wife and you're, you're crushing your hands? Or your wife is terrified that you're going to fall. If not doing it for yourself, do it for her. That's part of the problem of a lot of the frontal problems is that that, that, that empathy isn't there. If that empathy is still there, that's something you can use. But that was, that's what makes it so much more more difficult um and yeah and that, and that and that's where if they're falling a lot if they're you know you're using the u-step for for a reason um what trying to tease out what the objections to that walker are is it the walker or is it a walker in general maybe finding one that's a little less you know like some of the standard rollators might be a little bit easier to use or have a bigger footprint um but also if they're falling in the home, maybe it means setting up the environment so that there's things to touch so they can furniture surf. 
yeah. because having something for support. But yeah, there's there's not an easy answer for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I can really see that the way your mind works like a detective and your passion for trying to figure these things out. And so um, again, these are challenging issues and we appreciate your expert guidance and 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 uh, giving us some really great approaches and examples. Um, unfortunately, that's really all the time we have for today. Yeah. So it was great to have you on. Um, and um, we're now going to just do one additional commercial about what's coming down the road. Um, if I um, can share my slides, but if not, I'll mention that next, um, oh, I can, because I'm already there. Uh, hold on. Well, maybe you can't see them, but um, our, our next presenter is an occupational therapist and she's going to talk about OT and FTD care. So she's going to give all the news about what PT folks do, but we'll try to, to make it a, a, a nice segue on. That will be on Thursday, December 16th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and uh, it will be Maureen O'Neill Brown who will be speaking uh, with us. Um, we so much appreciate you joining us and we also very much appreciate uh, input from you attendees through our survey, which will come to you via email. We, we really, your, your input is very valuable to us so um, thank you for joining us and thank you for also letting us know how the program was helpful or if you want to learn something more or what future topics might be. Um, I, I think what I'd also say is don't forget about our website and our helpline. Uh, if you have questions or need information, uh, always available. And um, I and the staff and volunteers, and I'm sure Erica as well, uh, wish you a very happy, full and family-filled holiday next week and take care. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.